Well, why don't we go ahead and get started? It is 2 p.m. Eastern time. Welcome everyone um, to this webinar hosted by the Organic Farmers Association. My name is Kate Mendenhall and I'm the director of OFA. The mission of the Organic Farmers Association is to provide a strong and unified national voice for domestic certified organic producers. OFA aims to build and support a farmer-led national organic farmer movement and national policy platform. Today, we are excited to have Dave Chapman, Executive Director of the Real Organic Project, join us as a guest presenter to speak about the debate of hydroponics in organic. Hydroponic production in organics has been a long time debate on discussion among the organic community for more than the past decade. Dave Chapman has been involved in that debate from the beginning and will share his perspectives and experience of watching the changing debate, conversation, and outcomes around certified organic production, production in the US. In addition to founding and leading the Real Organic Project, Dave is also a longtime organic farmer in Vermont, growing greenhouse tomatoes in soil. Dave has served on the Organic Farmers Association Policy Committee for the past two years and was recently elected by his Northeast Organic Farmer peers to serve another two-year term. We appreciate his service in representing organic farmers on our policy committee. During Dave's presentation today, all attendees will be muted. We have over 100 attendees registered, and so we will monitor um, that participation through the, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So please use that Q&A feature to submit comments or questions. If you cannot see it at the bottom of your screen, if you put your cursor near the bottom of your screen and perhaps at the top of your screen, you should see a, um, a white file that has a Q on it and then below it says Q&A. And so if you click that, you can enter your question. Um, I will be helping Dave to moderate those questions at the end of the presentation we will allow for about 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes to answer questions. So as questions come up throughout the presentation, please feel free to submit them and we'll get to them at the end. Uh, now we will have Dave go ahead and share his screen and start the presentation. Thank you, Dave. Good. Um, Kate, can people see my screen? Yes, looks great. Okay, good. Hi, everybody. Um, so uh let's see here we're already not working okay um that's what i look like uh and uh i'm not used to doing a webinar i made a lot of slow a lot of slides uh that we are not going to look at all of and i'm going to kind of use them as a as a guide and and for people who are really interested in details we can go back later um so these, uh, Kate asked me to begin with the positions of the Organic Farmers Association on hydroponics, which is sort of what brought about this webinar. And, and the position of OFA is that they oppose organic certification of hydroponic production. And that was overwhelmingly passed. And a second position was that OFA is urging the National Organic Program to revoke organic certification of currently certified hydroponic systems and and uh, cease certifying new hydro. So I, I, you know, it's amazing that this has to be said, but um, organic farming has always been uh, based on the idea that a fertile soil will uh, make healthy crops healthy livestock and healthy human beings. I think the thing that has um, been added to that is since 1945 is, uh, <laughs> okay, is that, uh, sorry, the thing is taking care of itself, is that um, healthy climate is, is the thing that we all know is very important and how the the soil is tended is is critical to that so is this something that the usda understands well in 1980 the usda did issue a report on organic farming and that report got it right and among the things that they said you know in the foundational principles they said soil is the source of life 
and feed the soil. Uh, so uh, not the plant. So the systems of crop production, oh dear, the systems of crop production that eliminate soil from the system, um, such as hydroponics, cannot be considered as examples of acceptable organic farming practices. That's from the 2010 NOSB recommendation. And uh, that was a big deal that that, that that recommendation was passed. And, you know, it was detailed. It's, it was years in, in the creation. And um, it, it said clearly, it defined hydroponics. And I, I just want to read one little part here. Hydroponics, the production of plants in nutrient-rich solutions or moist inert material or aeroponics, a variation in which the roots are suspended in air um, and continually misted, these cannot be classified as certified organic growing due to their exclusion of the soil plant ecology. So, you know, significantly in the 2010 recommendation, it did not limit hydroponics to uh, plants being grown with their roots in a trough of water. It included plants grown in moist inert material, which is how most hydroponic production in conventional hydroponic production takes place for tomatoes, berries, uh, cucumbers, peppers. So the NOP in 2010 said, great, um, thank you. And we will develop a proposed rule based on this recommendation. The Organic Trade Association um, in 2010 also said, uh, great, they, they support keeping things consistent with Canada and they defined uh, hydroponics as uh, the cultivation of plants without the aid of soil. Uh, the soil is replaced by an inert culture medium such as coarse sands, expanded clay, rock wool. So again, everyone agreed what hydroponics means. And their website still says that they support the 2010, this is the Organic Trade Association website, still supports um, the 2010 recommendation. However, four years after 2010, the National Organic Program issued a statement saying that hydroponic production is allowed. And this was a huge shift. This is the first time that uh, the National Organic Program that I'm aware of actually opposed an NOSB recommendation. They've certainly ignored them before, but this is the first time they reversed it. So what happened in those four years that this is becoming the norm and the dominant uh, way of growing an organic greenhouse tomato. And people discovered there was a lot of money in organic hydroponics. And that money was like blood in the water. So the Organic Trade Association reversed their, their position. And I, I, I'm talking about OTA, and they were only one of four major forces that, that made it that hydroponics were allowed and uh but they were they were very powerful and and what they what the strategy appeared to be i don't know what the strategy what what they did was create a lot of confusion so uh they submitted written testimony in 2016 saying that they support the allowance for organic container and greenhouse production Although that same, uh, the next month, uh, Nate Lewis, who was their uh, foreign policy director, said to the New York Times that little distinguishes a container system from a hydroponic system. Quote, there really isn't much difference, he said. Well, that's a true statement. There really isn't much difference. Um, Again, testifying in, at the uh, St. Louis NOSB, they say they support the recommendation. This is, I, I included this slide because the statement was, it seems that there's a little bit of confusion about what a OTA's position is. 
and they want to clarify. They support the recommendation, but they believe that container and greenhouse production is distinct from hydroponics because container systems rely on biological activity for their success. So, um, bringing in a biological activity into conventional hydroponics is very common practice now. Uh, you know, many of them are adding mycorrhizal fungi to their liquid mix in a, uh, to their liquid feed and in hope of getting better production. There is biological activity in all water and all skin, and that's why doctors have to scrub so hard to get rid of it. And what they've done, and I, I, I'm harping on this because it's an important thing, is they've confused the conversation by saying, that because these containers have biological activity, they're not hydroponic. And that is an untrue statement. And um, if, if OTA doesn't understand it, they ought to understand it because they spent a lot of time studying this. So this, looking at this, this could be a picture of any conventional hydroponic production. It happens to be wholesome harvest. And uh, they've got 64 acres of glass greenhouses. It, it is all hydroponic. Uh, I certainly have good friends in the hydroponic world. And they said, geez, Dave, you're, you're, uh, one of them was visiting. He said, you're a little rough on, on the Crescentes. And I said, well, you know, they're nice people. But, but you know, they, they tell people that their production isn't hydroponic. And his eyebrows went up because he's a hydroponic producer. He's not ashamed of being, of being hydroponic. And the idea that this is not hydroponic is a crazy statement. These are hydroponic uh, cherry tomatoes also from Wholesome Harvest. And we're now in a world where organic is what we say it is. So another major player in the debate was CCOF, the California Certified Organic Farmers. And um, this was a statement that um, Phil made at the Denver NOSB. And um, basically, CCOF has taken the position that we should allow hydroponic, but we need to label it. And um, they say, and they say that, that the hydroponic producers have no problem with labeling it. Let the consumer decide. So I don't think it's true that, that they have no trouble uh, labeling it. This is from a statement from Wholesome Harvest marketing manager, Jesse Gunn. Greenhouse grown or container grown, even hydroponic, though we don't produce hydroponically, is not a bad word for consumers. This is Driscoll's saying, if you write them, I think you'll get the same response. I've had several people send me letters uh, that they sent to Driscoll's asking about hydroponic. And the response was, Driscoll's does not grow hydroponic, aquaponic, or aeroponic crops. And this is Driscoll's production. Um, so one of the things I served on the USDA task force, and one of the things that I learned on that task force that we all learned is that Driscoll's is actually the biggest hydroponic organic producer in the world. And in 2016, uh, Driscoll's had over 1,000 acres of organic hydroponic berries. This picture is taken from the uh, USDA task force report, and it was submitted as a case study for Driscoll's. We didn't know that, that Driscoll's was growing anything hydroponically. It was really shocking news to us, but, but we learned it. It was, it was, you know, we were presented with a report right before the task force ended. And we were stunned to discover that Driscoll's was the major hydroponic producer, um, hydroponic certified organic producer in the world. And we suddenly realized why we were having such a difficult time. 
Um, this is a statement from Driscoll's, from Emily Musgrave, their organic program manager, that uh, they are now about 65 to 70% of the U.S. market share in organic berries, effectively a monopoly, and they're growing. Um, do you think uh, this was a question for uh, a president of Driscoll's in, in an interview? And I'm not going to read it. He's basically saying that Driscoll's, and this is not explicitly talking about organic, but they're moving to hydroponic production as quickly as they can. Substrate production means hydroponic. It means you're growing in a non-fertile uh, blend and you're providing the nutrition as a liquid feed. Uh, and here he says that um, that they're Organic production is growing much faster than conventional. It's probably growing three times faster than conventional. This is Ian Justice, um, who testified several times for Driscoll's to the National Organic Standards Board. And uh, Emily Oakley asked him that uh, what percentage of their production was in ground versus container grown. And he said that less than one or even less than half a percent was container grown. Now, we had learned uh, I, with absolute certainty they had over a thousand acres at that point. So uh, what he's saying is that they have over a hundred thousand acres of, um, of organic production. I, I find that a little hard to believe. Maybe it's true. I know that their production was over a thousand acres and I know it's growing quickly. We move into some of the other um, hydroorganic. This is Florida uh, happening on a huge scale and um, one of the greenhouses, more pots lined out. Um, this is some uh, tabletop berries as they call them. This is, uh, honestly, this picture could be conventional, it could be organic. Um, I am not certain if this is organic. The other pictures, I am certain they are certified organic. But I wanted to give you uh, an, an image of what this looks like. It's, it's kind of beautiful, but uh, it would be hard to call it organic. And now we get into the aeroponics. So Farmed Here was the largest organic vertical farm in the U.S., and they're now out of business. And of course, Plenty. Um, so Plenty is, is certified organic. I, I checked the organic, organic Integrity Database and Plenty Unlimited, which is Plenty, um, is certified. And um, last year they raised over $200 million from investors such as Bezos and Musk. And their plans are to spread all over the world. The one thing that that the NOSB agreed on in Jacksonville is that this should not be certified. Um, they already, the, the, they couldn't pass any other recommendations. So in Jacksonville, Florida in 2017, there was a failure to pass a new recommendation. So the standing recommendation is hydroponic should not be allowed. But the one recommendation that was passed was confirmation that um, aeroponics should not be certified and it's being certified widely. So is this the future of USDA organic? Is this what, you know, I would say that is this what the organic farms of tomorrow are gonna look like? But the truth is, this is what the, some organic farms of today look like. Um, one of the things that one berry grower said to me that as this kind of production is certified, it almost becomes mandated because you can't compete with uh, hydroponic production without being able to identify yourself in the marketplace. And these large hydroponic producers not only don't identify it, but they've got this wonderful marketing that makes them seem like these back to the lander hippie farmers and um it's just marketing but uh this is the reality so th something that tom steyer said recently i'm not hostile to capitalism 
I'm hostile to corporations writing the laws for themselves against the interests of the American people. And I think that that's what's going on. And that's probably a subject for a, a different webinar, but it, it is uh, really important that we're up against systemic problems here. These are not a few bad players. These are the structure of the USDA and the relationship of the USDA to, to corporations are what it is that's getting us where we're at. This was the USDA task force I served on. Um, and uh, there were 15 people. Originally, it was limited to only hydroponic producers. We raised a fuss. They put five of us. That's the five on the left. We are the token soil folks. The other 10 were the hydroponic producers. They're not bad people. I consider some of them friends. We're missing one of them. I see, I don't see Pierre there. Um, and of course, Miles up front. Um, this was us touring a hydroponic operation. Just an example of what some hydroponics looks like. Um, this might be their compost pile, so to speak. This is where the, the fertilizers are blended and pumped in. This is Miles visiting. That was the missing guy from that, that other picture, Pierre Sliman. Uh, very nice guy. I like him quite a lot. He's got a five acre certified organic uh, hydroponic operation that, in my opinion, should not be certified. It's a fine hydroponic operation. They do a great job. This is the Secretary of Agriculture touring that same greenhouse. Pierre's a very good marketer. Uh, but we can see one of the things when I, when I tried to figure out why we were getting so much pushback um, from uh, the National Organic Program, when we started fighting about this, I was like, why, why are you fighting? for this. I don't understand it. Uh, the whole organic community is opposed to certifying hydroponic. And what we were told is that, you know, Miles said he, he, he wanted to see, he wanted to encourage innovation. But what we were told from um, extremely reliable sources at the top levels of the USDA were being, were being lobbied uh, for some years leading up to this. And um, it's important to note that almost none of this production was being certified before the 2010 recommendation. Driscoll's did not have any hydroponic production before 2010. So all of this has really come up. There, there was some small, small production before, but almost all of this has come up after the recommendation passed. People knew that they were walking into a minefield. And even in 2016, less than 1% of the certified organic uh, producers were some kind of hydroponic, aquaponic container-based system. Less than 1%, but not less than 1% of sales. So what we're dealing with is, I mean, Driscoll's is huge. They are, I believe, they're the biggest organic um, produce vendor in the world and um and i think in the country so uh you know they have a lot of influence and and Olson is a big company they have a lot of influence um and this was just um saying that fewer than 200 of the uh operations in 2017 are hydroponic producers but there's a line forming of foreign growers wanting to sell in the US in the organic label. So these are two, two of those foreign producers. These are organic pepper growers. These are hydroponic pepper growers in Holland. And uh, their peppers could not be sold as organic in Holland. They are certified. You can see on the right, their boxes say USDA organic. Um, EU does not honor uh, this as an organic pepper. So if they have oversupply and they have to sell it in Holland, it gets sold as conventional. Mexico prohibits hydroponic. Canada prohibit, uh, prohibits hydroponic 
to be certified as organic. This is from Bright House. So Bright House is um, a new player. Uh, their parent company is uh, Nature Suite, which is a big 1,600-acre uh, producer of conventional uh, greenhouse tomatoes. And uh, they were very involved in the Coalition for Sustainable Organics in forming that before they had any organic production at all. And they started a new brand called Bright House after Jacksonville. And it's just interesting that, you know, they, they're claiming all the wonderful things. And I just love that they say that they grow uh, in coconut husks hydroponically to naturally protect the plants from disease. And this is pretty much the opposite of uh, the organic perspective on plant health and, and root health. So um, I don't think I'm going to go into this. Anyone who's interested can go back and, and read it. CCOF, uh, you know, was very open in their support of certifying hydroponic, in, including water-based. As far as I know, they didn't distinguish about aeroponic. And I agree, uh, there really isn't much difference between aeroponic and cocoa coir. It's, it's a matter of how you manage um, the root system. Uh, when, when the aeroponic prohibition was passed um, at Jacksonville, there was one vote that abstained, and he, he said, I don't see how we can allow hydroponic and prohibit aeroponic and i think he was completely right it didn't make any sense so bright house uh, uh on the right david Furman testified in pittsburgh uh in november of 2019 and i think that i'm going to read this quotation because it's kind of significant the words yesterday soul of organic were used and i was the person who used them and I also thought about some words from November of 2016, where they talked about the magic of the soil. And I think about that language really as a kind of fluff used to distract from the real motivation for that opposition group, which would be to limit supply and artificially and benefit from the higher price that would result. So really purely economic. It's good to know that these guys are not motivated by economics. But I, I think that we here now have uh, somebody with an enormously influential voice in setting the USDA standards for organic, who's basically saying that talking about the magic of soil is a, a kind of fluff. And, you know, what is happening to us? What is happening to organic and the meaning of organic in America? Um, so Leif Frankel was the spokesperson for the uh, uh, Coalition for Sustainable Organics. And in two articles, he claimed that in 2017, in the last year, they had had a billion dollars in hydroorganic sales. Keep the Soil Inorganic was a movement that came out of all this. And we had a number of rallies. The first one was a very spontaneous event at the Stowe NOSB meeting in 2015. Um, I, I just like this picture. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, about 50 farmers showed up and everybody had a good time. A year later, we had uh, a rally that was more planned. And Senator Leahy came and spoke, Peter Welsh came and spoke, uh, Shelley Pingree, Elliot Coleman. And this is uh, Enid and Kate leading that rally. Um, and we had about 250 people, we guessed, driving down the road. We had, I think, 26 tractors, Pete Johnson leading that. And Elliot was there and he said, we the creators refuse to see the promise of organic farming compromised by profiteers. We won before and we will win again. Senator Leahy said, let organic be organic, be organic. So Peter Welsh 
uh, very strong, said they pile on and take some of that market share with a label that wasn't earned. So what happened out of this is we started to have a movement and um, we sent a, a, a letter, we called the moratorium letter to Secretary Vilsack asking for a moratorium on the certification of hydroponic. And it was signed originally by seven farmers, uh, Elliot and Anis Bedard and Davy Miskell and, and Pete Johnson and Margit uh, Hall and Drew Rivers and me. And then many organizations, over 40 organizations and many individuals, and these are just some, and you can go back and look at this if you want. And uh, well, one thing I'll say is that um, that letter did bring about a meeting between three of us uh, farmers and uh, Miles McAvoy and um, Eleanor Starmer, the, the director of the Agricultural Marketing Service, in which she said that she supported us and she wrote a letter calling for a moratorium and the USDA lawyer said, absolutely, you can't, you can't do that because if you do, we're going to get sued. And I thought, well, if you don't, you're going to get sued too. So what's the difference? But they would not do it. And so, so Senator Leahy also sent a letter to Secretary Vilsack asking for uh, a symposium on new certification of hydroponics. And Senator Leahy's been a real supporter and champion. Of course, he was the uh, co-author of the original Organic Food Production Act, and he's still fighting for us. Um, and Peter Welsh, Representative Peter Welsh, and Senator Bernie Sanders also sent a letter. And, you know, Bernie's with us, and Peter's with us. So we're starting to get the word out. We're starting to get champions. Shelley Pingree spoke at the Thetford uh, rally in the valley and there are 1200 lobbyists on capitol hill who work for the agriculture and food processing industry they spend about 350 million dollars a year that's more than the defense industry so don't underestimate their power they would like to change a lot of things and water down the organic brand and the consumers will be completely confused. This is critically important. And she got it right on, and that is exactly what's happening. So two weeks after Senator Leahy presented his letter to Vilsack, the Coalition for Sustainable Organics was formed. This is another trade group. Of course, Organic Trade Association is a trade association lobbying for their members. Their members include Driscoll's and Wholesome Harvest. This is another group. We aren't sure who the members are. It's always been a secretive group. Obviously, the name is secretive in the sense that they are the Coalition for Hydroponic Organics. And their, their slogan was, everyone deserves organic. And, uh, you know, they look for the emotional buttons that they can push. This is one of the few people we know is actually a member of it, and that's Theo Crisantes from, uh, who's you know one of the people who runs Wholesome Harvest, and they actually got to testify to the Senate Ag Committee, and they asked for, they asked for um, basically a more active role for industry in the whole thing, and. Um, I thought it was just telling, this is not about other issues than, than hydroponic, but it was telling that he went on, and his last point was to say that um, they feel that the focus of uh, the federal engagement on organics is on outlier issues like whether a shade porch for poultry attaches to a roof at three points versus two points. And, you know, my point is that this is a, a blatant, uh, alignment with the CAFO uh, poultry production, which is why they were allowed to testify, because these are the two ranking members of the Senate Ag Committee, and they also are the advocates for the two biggest organic uh, uh, CAFO poultry operations in America. The final rally, there were 17 rallies over three years. The final rally was in Jacksonville, Florida. And um, 
I think 60 farmers, I think, came in and testified um, at, at Jacksonville, and we lost. And that was the NOSB chair, Tom Chapman, pretty strong advocate for hydroponic, and Jenny Tucker. Seven of the board stood up for us, and these are them. I always like to show this picture. They're brave people. It's not easy going up against big industry. And uh, six of them are members of, uh, of the Real Organic Project. I, I applaud all of them. Um, since Jacksonville, one thing that has become a big issue was the issue of transition time for, for uh, organic certification. And uh, I had been told uh, by farmers that um, glyphosate was being used just prior to uh, certification for, um, for hydroponic berry production in Florida and in California. And uh, I actually asked this at a OFA meeting with Jenny Tucker. And we went around a bit, and finally she did acknowledge that if glyphosate were being used a few weeks before production, that that would not disqualify someone from certification. And the air went out of the room, and uh, it became a big issue. The uh, Real Organic Project wrote a bunch of letters about it. Ultimately, there was a Civil Eats article which is what this picture is from and this headline. And uh, after, after all of that started, uh, Jenny refused to answer direct questions. She said, these are, these are hypotheticals. These are not real examples. So then we sent out a letter uh, with a letter from Amerisert, which is a certified, uh, uh, an accredited certifier. And I'm not gonna read it, but they basically said, this is not a hypothetical. They said, we've written uh, the National Organic Program, reached out to them several times looking for clarification because we do certify with no transition time. We do allow glyphosate. And it was really proof that, that we were being misled by um, the, the National Organic Program on this issue. And um, it, it was known for a long time before all of this came out. So the week after um, that letter releasing the Amerisert, the USDA reversed their position and issued a memo on June 3rd, 2019 that um, said, this memo clarifies that the legal requirements related to the three-year transition period apply to all container systems built and maintained on land. And, you know, a question I got very quickly after reading that is, what does that mean on land? Does that mean that they're not including greenhouses? And uh, I'm sorry, I want to go back once. And uh, so far, the NOP has refused to answer that question. They've been asked a number of times by many certifiers. They've been asked by members of the NOSB a number of times. They've been asked by me a number of times. And they will not answer whether or not um, there is a transition time in terms of the use of prohibited uh, pesticides in greenhouses. And uh, if they don't prohibit it, then there's no reason that a greenhouse can't cycle in and out just the way they're doing with origin of livestock and say, okay, we're growing hydroponically, organically for this year. And then in December, we're gonna uh, bomb the house, kill everything in it, and drop certification, and two weeks later, get recertified. So because we've got huge uh, operations like Nature Suite, 1,600 acres of conventional greenhouse production transitioning over, this, these are big questions. Um, I just finally wanted to touch base um, on climate change. And um, this was a, a OTA statement. We're starting to get concerned that an assumption's being made that if you're not growing in the outer crust of the earth, there's no way you can sequester carbon 
or mitigate climate change. Those are assumptions. I haven't seen anyone compare the full cycle of a tomato grown in one system versus the other. There's so many factors. Well, <laughs> actually, I mean, I'm pretty sure that you can't sequester uh, carbon in, in a hydroponic system, but the suggestion that this is a complicated issue and that, and that sequestering carbon in the soil and the many other things that happen by growing in soil in terms of the effect on the water cycle and the effect on more green matter on the land, all these things are major influences of, of uh, climate stability and climate change. And I just think this is a perfect example of greenwashing and misleading. And this is from Wholesome Harvest. I think portions of the Organic Food Production Act focus so much on the soil that it forgot the planet. Uh, again, this is, this is just shameful greenwashing. So we started the Real Organic Project and uh, after Jacksonville, I just wanna briefly, briefly mention, you know, we now got 220 certified pilot farms and we got another 80 applications that have been approved but we haven't yet inspected them. So we're, we're pretty much up to 300 farms. More are coming in every day. Um, we got 45 board members on three different boards, farmers, scientists, vendors, uh, nonprofits, and eaters. Four of our board members are current NOSB members, 15 are former NOSB members, three are NOC board members, and eight our OFA policy committee or governing council members. We are the organic movement. Um, this is uh, ROP associate director, Lindley Dixon out inspecting a farm. She travels all over the country as do our other inspectors. Last year, we had a symposium uh, at Dartmouth College. It was a wonderful one day event. This year, we have another one coming up next April. And I just hope that people will come because there will be a much more in-depth discussion of these issues about not just what is going on, what's gone wrong, but how do we change it? And, and how do we build an alternative to that? Another alternative is the regenerative organic certification. And here's Jeff Moyer, who's one of the leaders of that from Rodale Institute. This is Jeff down at the rally in Jacksonville. And Jeff has a, a double impact here because Jeff was on the NOSB, was the president of the uh, chair of the NOSB, but he was on the, the subcommittee that created the 2010 recommendation. And um, there were two strong voices on that subcommittee. One was Jeff and one was Jerry Davis from Grimway. And Jerry wanted to allow containers and Jeff wanted to keep it simple the way the Europeans do and say, organic should be in the ground. And I thought it was really significant that Jerry Davis got up at Jacksonville. He was one of the few uh, California farmers who actually showed up and said, I was wrong. Organic should be in the ground. And, uh, you know, and of course, instead, uh, now we're certifying walls of aeroponic lettuce. So there is the other way of moving forward is to actually reform the National Organic Program. That's obviously a pretty hard sale right now, but um, the Center for Food Safety uh, has filed a petition back in February, um, basically demanding regulations prohibiting organic certification of hydroponics. And that Petition has gone through and been rejected by the USDA, so we presume that will move on to a lawsuit. And uh, this is uh, George Kimbrell, the, the legal director, saying basically what they're doing is illegal, and you can read it later if you want. So finally, my final slide, and look at that, Kate, I have one minute to go. It is possible. Um, I'll read this one. It's the entire society that benefits from organic farming. It's not just organic eaters. It's not just organic farmers. It's everybody. When we look at climate change, when we look at many, many secondary 
side effects of, of organic farming. Denmark acknowledges this and has committed $160 million to transitioning organic production over a five-year period to 30% of the country's agriculture. Right now, 40% of the milk and eggs in Denmark are certified organic. Right now, almost 80% of Danes buy some organic food. I think their produce is, I think it's at 35% is certified organic. So they're doing an amazing job. If the US spent an equivalent amount of our GDP, that would be over $9 billion spent over a five year period to take the country organic. And we could do an amazing job of that. So I mentioned this, it's very important that, that um, it is possible to have good government. It is possible to move the needle, but to do that, we need to have a movement. We gotta be able to light up the switchboard, you know, as Michael Pollan has said, until we can light up the switchboard, we don't have a movement. So here we are in the OFA and the Real Organic Project in Rock. Uh, trying to build that movement. And that's it. Um, thank you very much. We'll be open for questions. I did put the uh, final link at the bottom, keep the soil in organic.org, because if you're interested in things like those moratorium letters, there's a lot of background information that's never switched over to a real organic project. Okay, Kate. Great, thank you so much, Dave. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in, and before we move to those, um, I'm gonna try to group the questions in, um, in similar topic areas. Um, but I just wanna clarify a couple of things based on some of the questions I see coming in. Um, both the Real Organic Project and uh, Rodale's um, Regenerative Organic Certification, those are both add-on labels. Through those other two entities as an add on label. So that was one point I wanted to clarify. And then I also um, have seen some questions coming in alarmed by the, uh, the, the thing that Dave um, brought up about the article covered in Civil Eats about the spraying of um, glyphosate before a container production was transitioned to organic. And just to clarify that although it seems that the USDA was allowing that practice, they have So Dave, excuse, ex questions excuse me, you're breaking up for me, Kate. Is that, I don't know if that's true for everyone else, but go ahead. Shoot. Um, well, I just wanted to clarify, is that better? Yeah, um, I can hear you now, yeah. That the, the USDA clarified that that is no longer um, being allowed and um, <laughs> working on the USDA to clarify, but I wanted to yeah. move to some questions that have come in. Um, people are asking for clarity around the, like, what is uh, container production and what, um, what sort of materials are going into these quote unquote organic processes. So Dave, could you please start by um, giving us a, a definition of what contain, container production is? and what yeah. material is commonly being used? So um, when people are talking, when Driscoll's and, and all came up with the idea that container production is different from hydroponic, what they were doing was trying to cast hydroponic as being a situation in which plant roots are sitting in a, uh, a pipe filled with water, as opposed to sitting in a pot filled with um, something like coconut husks. So in, in both cases, all the nutrition is coming from the liquid feed. Uh, a, a, a tomato plant with its roots sitting in a box filled with coconut husks is not, even if you throw in a handful of compost, it's not getting its nutrition from the substrate, from the medium in the container. It's getting its nutrition 
99% of its nutrition is coming from the liquid feed and they're mixing it in a tank and then dripping it in. So container production in, in the way that it's being talked about by OTA and Driscoll's just means that the roots are in a container filled with coconut husks instead of a container filled with water. Thank you, Dave. And, you know, for uh, container production, there's a lot of variety. Um, but there are small to large growers who are using lots of different substrates in those containers. Some of them are soil. The next question is from Can a I, I'm farmer. sorry, Kate. Okay, could I just clarify one thing? There is such a thing as container production in which there is no liquid feed. And uh, in the EU, that is still forbidden um, at, to be certified as organic. I have grown that way myself in the past, and I decided to stop doing it years ago. But we did grow in these large containers, and we gave no liquid feeding. The only feed we gave essentially was uh, compost and alfalfa meal. So it is possible to do that in what I would say is essentially an organic system. And then the question is, what are you going to allow or not allow? And the, the, the recommendation that was defeated in Jacksonville was about that. It was saying, if you were to grow in a container, you know, let's limit the amount of uh, liquid uh, nitrogen that you could give uh, to 20%, I think it was. So. So Dave, we have a question from a grower who grows organic blueberry bushes for sale. He asks, if we dig a bush soil ball in a five gallon pot to sell to a condo resident who wants to grow organic blueberries, is it no longer organic as soon as we pot it? No, it's, it's organic. Um, the 2000 recommendation and the EU and Canada and Mexico, everybody says, you know, growing of transplants and containers is accepted. So, uh, you know, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a situation in which the crop spends uh, all of its life in a container being fed liquid. And uh, so there are different situations. Transplants are allowed. We have a lot of questions about what kind of materials are being used to fertilize. Um, operations whether in water or in pots are those synthetic materials that are being put in there so um, exactly what materials are being used is a secret it's a trade secret and even on the USDA task force the uh, 10 hydroponic uh, representatives would not disclose what their recipes were what they basically gave us was a list of everything that was allowed by Omri. So I think that everyone agrees that the things being used are uh, supposed to be allowed by Omri. I will point out that, you know, Omri allows uh, hydrolyzed soy protein, which, you know, can have a, a readout of 1700. So it's a quite a hot process. And the big hydro producers that I personally know who are doing certified organic production, they're now installing hydrolysis units on their operations. They bring in things like <laughs> conventional soy meal and, and, and hydrolyze it. It's an expensive process, but uh, the, the uh, tremendously high yields they get make it uh, extremely profitable. Um, we have one question about, it says the, it seems that the argument about hydroponics and organics is that it has nothing to do with the soil and that the exclusion of synthetics is not important. It clearly shows it's superior to tillage systems in preserving soil health. Kate, I'm sorry, but you broke up. I, I couldn't hear you. So try that question again. Apologies. I don't know how to fix this on the, the webinar at the moment, but I'll try again. Um, we have a question that says, it seems like the argument against hydroponics and organics is that it has to do with soil and that the exclusion of synthetics is not important unless it protects the health of soil. 
In your opinion, should we exclude hydroponics and include no till systems utilized in it's superior to tillage systems in preserving soil health? I'm sorry, I could not understand your question. I will send it to you in a chat. Okay, great. Okay, it seems like the argument against hydroponics in organics is, has nothing to do with the soil and that the exclusion of synthetics is not important unless it protects the health of the soil. In your opinion, should we then exclude hydroponics and include no-till systems that utilize synthetic herbicides as the research clearly shows that it's superior to tillage systems in preserving soil health? I don't agree with that conclusion. And no, I don't think that we should uh, allow herbicides. And there's lots of research that shows that uh, organic tillage systems well done uh, are, are uh, at least as good, if not better, than no-till systems in terms of building organic matter. So uh, this is a complicated, big topic. And, you know, we should have a symposium just about it. But uh, to say that that's a fact is, it, you know, there's lots of, Lots of proof to the to that disagrees with that. Um, I'm sending you another question. Good. Uh, it's at the bottom. At this time. At this time, so I don't see it. So let me try opening up again. Maybe it'll it'll uh, show up. Uh, <laughs> I'm not getting it. Why don't you try reading it? <laughs> oh, here we go. At this time, what is the best label consumers should use to make sure they're avoiding pesticides? Um, I think that, uh, that the USDA label is... Uh, <sighs> okay, I honestly believe that... Uh, the Real Organic Project label and the Regenerative Organic Certification label would be perhaps more trustworthy, but uh, I, I'm speaking from my intuition here. Um, none of them uh, are allowing pesticides. There is pesticide use. None of them are allowing synthetic pesticides. There is pesticide use allowed in USDA certification. And, uh, and so is there, it's not prohibited out of hand by either the add-on labels either. But uh, what is required in the add-on labels is uh, the kind of tending to the health of the soil that should make those um, pesticides unnecessary. And uh, I don't know if that's very helpful. I would be more cautious about anything imported. I think that there's much more room for fraud on imported stuff than stuff that's grown in the US. Uh, next question, are sprouts hydroponic? No, uh, sprouts were explicitly uh, exempted from that discussion in the 2010 recommendation, also in the EU standards. Sprouts are not considered farming, they're considered processing. Uh, next question, the hydroponic proponents claim that they are saving a tremendous amount of water in production, which is important in many locations. Have you been able to verify or compare water usage for soil-based versus hydro users? Are their claims really accurate? So this is a great question. And it's a, a, like, like all great questions, it's not a simple answer. So in a good organic system, water isn't used, it's recycled. And uh, in fact, a good organic system becomes the engine for uh, healing a broken water cycle. If, if, uh, if you drive across uh, the valley in California, Lindley has told me that you know, she can see when she's coming to an organic farm because it's green and everything else is brown. And it's because the soil can hold so much more water because it's got organic matter in it. And so, I think it's true that if you live in the sub-Saharan desert, that you might need to rely on something like hydroponics in order to feed yourself. And uh, 
you know, I know Steve Deaver actually did a lot of research on hydroponics for that very reason, to help people in incredibly harsh, disadvantaged circumstances be able to grow calories. But he also insisted that that food would inherently be inferior. And, um, it, but if you're starving to death, it's food. So I think that the real issue is that we are trying to build an organic landscape. We're trying to build an organic ecosystem. And uh, the soil is a critical part of that. So it rains and the, the plants take up the water, the soil holds the water. And as the plants evaporate the water, they're also releasing microbes that help us get rain clouds instead of, uh, you know, uh, haze high in the air. This is a big conversation. Uh, I really recommend somebody who wants to learn this, Google Walter Jena, J-E-H-N-E, and listen to a couple hours of his talks, and he really goes into great detail on it. Are you there, Kate? Yeah, can you hear me? Now yes. I'm hoping this is Maria. Maria. Uh, Kate, can you talk or do you want me to close? Since my audio has been unreliable, Mar Maria, would you mind closing for me? Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, for attending today. Um, we we really appreciate Dave's uh, sharing um, uh, his expertise with us today. And thank you for all the work uh, put together on uh, the detailed presentation and, and the answers to all the questions. Uh, we, will, we recorded this session and it will be available on our website probably early next week. Um, and for all of you who participated in this webinar, we have more to come and we can always, you can always join us uh, at on our website, uh, theorganicfarmersassociation.org. Um, we have one more uh, webinar scheduled in February. Um, as always, we, we would like to invite you to join us as a farmer member or supporting member. Um, we encourage you all to be part of this national movement. And uh, if you would like to find out more about our work, uh, you can always go to our website, theorganicfarmersassociation.org. And uh, have a great day, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today.